pollution, there'll be no pollution. I'm so thankful I've decided to change my ways. Welcome back to the Leaving Eden podcast. My name is Gavriel Hakoen. And I am cult survivor, cult expert, Sadie Carpenter. And today we have a topic that we've been asked about many, 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 many times. And it's one of those topics that it's it's almost like it's ubiquitous within fundamentalism is that people talk about this. Mm-hmm. Well, it it is. Um, not everyone in fundamentalism raises their children by the book To Train Up a Child by Michael and Debbie Pearl. But pretty much everyone in fundamentalism has heard of it, and most people use some similar methods. And when I say most, 95% or higher of people who raise children in fundamentalism use similar methods. Oh, so a lot of podcasts and a lot of, of people in the similar uh, uh, sphere as us have spoken at length about to train up a child. Um Mostly because it's it is so ubiquitous and is and it is so well known. And Michael and Debbie Pearl are they're they're, so, they're somewhat lionized within certain mm-hmm. uh, 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 areas of fundamentalism. So Sadie and I read this book. This book is, I mean, you you and I or, or anybody could pretty much look at this book and read it and and say on its surface this book is bad and you shouldn't raise your kids like that. Right. But. What we decided to do, what we thought would be the better way to do this than doing that would be by bringing on somebody who has actual qualifications to talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. Credentials, expertise, uh, studies. Um, So if you remember back in um, about a year ago, we did a review of the mental health book written by Jack Scopp uh, called uh, uh, Healing for the Inner Hurt. Uh, we brought on uh, uh, Dr. Shoshana Fagan, and that was a really great episode, and we thought that she had a lot of excellent contributions. So we decided to bring her back to talk about uh, To Train Up a Child by Michael and Debbie Pearl, and that is the subject of today's episode. Yeah, she's not only a real expert and really educated, she's also just a great hang. And I think that's a good combination when we are talking about a book that is very upsetting and can be triggering to a lot of people yeah and uh, truly like the stuff that i was reading in this book i don't have any experience with any of the techniques that were used in this book thankfully but reading it like legit over the week and a half two weeks that i spent actually reading this book it 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 like i don't know it put me in like a state of brain fog to like be like constantly thinking about this and like writing notes in our document about it and like actually like trying to intellectualize the things that we're saying it it's it, it like this is this is not an easy book to read in that no, regard and it, it's not an easy book to talk about but we are going to do our best to give you a heads up before we read the awful things um to leave out awful things that don't serve a purpose for us explaining something and i, I know that this topic in general is triggering for a lot of people and if you need to skip, I understand. But I encourage you not to because if if you think you will be okay, because this episode isn't just about look at these horrible things. It's look at these horrible things that these people recommend. Uh, here is why they are horrible. Here is how a person can heal from this kind of abuse if they've had it happen to them. Uh, it, it's a little deeper than, oh my goodness, look at these horrible things. Yeah, and that's why I'm glad that we had uh, Dr. Fagan on. Um, But before we get into that, the Leaving Eden podcast is the podcast about my BFF and co-host Sadie Carpenter's life in and escape from the independent fundamental Baptist uh, church, the, the cult in which she was raised. So we talk about this cult, we talk about other cults, we talk about religion, we talk about fundamentalism, we talk about the real and present threat that cults and cult ideologies pose to society as a whole, and it is our goal to promote freedom of mind and freedom of thought and freedom of religion. So if you like our show, if you are a fan of our show, then head on over to our Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast, where you will find an extended version of most of our episodes. I know today's episode, there is going to be an extended version of that. So if you want 
to listen to that, go over to patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. There's a couple of Patreon exclusives coming up in the near future. One of which is going to be a solo episode by Sadie about a, a TikTok scammer who uses cult techniques to to scam people on TikTok. And then there's going to be another one that we're going to record coming soon about the astrological signs of like famous fundies. And, and that's just going to be, you know, for fun. But that's going to be on our Patreon in the coming weeks or months. Um yeah, uh, you can join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus, uh, which is, I think, the main discussion place where we, we have discussions about the show and our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Also a great place to discuss the podcast. Good times, good times, good times. A couple of other things to promote. If you are listening to this episode on release day, then you're listening to it on May 1st. Uh, Tomorrow, uh, which coincidentally happens to be my birthday, my 30th birthday. Happy birthday to me. Um, happy birthday. Thank you. Uh, we are, uh, this, Sadie and I are appearing on the She Read podcast. We sat down with Allie, uh, uh, who hosts the show, to talk about a book from Sadie's childhood. And that was a lot of fun. And we did that about a week and a half ago. And that episode is coming out tomorrow. So make sure that you go and check out uh, the She Read podcast. You can find them on Instagram. It's SSR Pod, right? Um, yes, SSR Pod on Instagram. We talked about a non traumatic book from my childhood. You're welcome. <laughs> it was a good book. I, I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, we talked about the book Emily of New Moon. So if you're also a fan of. Uh, uh, of, of that book same author as Anne of green gables you if you want to go and uh and listen to that that's a, a great interview that was a great time uh, we had and that's a great podcast as well also if you are an lgbtq person who uh got out of fundamentalism or who was raised in fundamentalism or some other repressive group please 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 if you are interested in 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 writing a story to us uh, and, and having us read your, your personal story on the air, that's a tradition that we have for the month of June, um, for Pride Month. So make sure that you get those stories in uh, and, and you can send them to leavingedenpod at gmail.com. If you are going to send us a Pride story, um, make sure that you let us know what name you would like to be called on air, especially if your name is different from like your email signature or anything like that, or if you need to use a pseudonym for whatever reason. And let us know what your pronouns are so that we can refer to you correctly. We've already gotten at least one Pride story that was just fantastic. Yeah, it was a really emotional read for me. Yeah. I, I really, man, I, I, got a, I got a lot out of reading that one. It was very good. Let's see. Uh, Sadie, do you want to thank our patrons? Let's do it. Our <clears throat> I Gave It All tier patrons are Kathleen Moncrief and Melissa Mosley. Thank you so much to Kathleen and Melissa for your support. Our Faith Promise Missions tier patrons are Alex P., Alex Todd, Alicia Guild, Ali Allen, Anisha Patel, Brooke Tully, Krissa, Crystal Patterson, Dear Ethan Hansen the Musical, Eleanor Donahue, Emery Fair Losser, Enchanted Fairy 1389, Esther Murdoff, Hannah Ross, Hope Norum, Horton Hears a Shane, Janine Callen, Jen Kuharski, Jessica Tambo, Jonna Kat Henwood, Kater Wee, Kristen Marie, Linda Morgan, Lindsay Goss, Lorena Watson, Madeline Cusick, Marlena Stuve, Mary Williams, Mary Martin, Megan Arndt, Rob the Methodist, Sarah Reese, Scooby Sleuth, <laughs> oh god, <laughs> Sir Takes a Lot, hashtag it's cool, I have Tourette's, thank you. <laughs> For making me read that on air. Who's that? Is that Big Sexy? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Stephanie Johnson, Susie, Tara McNamara, Tiffany Enderby, and as always, what's the cowboy? Thank you guys so much for uh, supporting us on our Patreon. And thank you to everybody who supports us on our Patreon. We do love you guys. And that's really the thing that makes it possible for us to do this show that is, is the listener support. So obviously this episode is going to need a, a, a very strong TW. Sadie, do you want to give us that? So in general, we talk about a lot of potentially triggering topics on this show, including but not limited to suicide and mental health, racism, misogyny, PTSD, PTSD symptoms, child abuse, mental, physical and sexual abuse and spiritual abuse, including guilt, shame and fear. 
In most episodes, we will mention at least a few of these topics. We try to avoid any graphic detail unless it's relevant to the story that we're telling. And we do our best to give the audience a heads up before we go into detail on any of these topics. This entire episode carries a trigger warning for child abuse, specifically for hitting, spanking, hitting with implements, what implements are recommended to hit your child, how to hit, how to break a child's spirit, all, all of that. We will not be able to give an additional trigger warning before every time we mention it because it is the entire episode. Of course, we will be validating survivors of such abuse. We'll be talking scientifically about why it's not okay. We will try to use language that's less triggering wherever it's possible, but it is the entire topic and context of this episode. We will also briefly mention uh, topics such as complementarianism, wives submitting to husbands, marital rape, briefly mention the deaths of several children which were related to the teachings put forth in this book. On all of those topics, we won't include specific stories, we won't include detailed stories, because that's what's not relevant to the actual content of this episode. Thank you so much for that. Um, and so without further ado, let's get into our uh, talk that we have with Shoshana. We are here today with uh, 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 Dr. Shoshana Fagan. Shoshana, how are you doing today? Doing pretty well. How are you folks? I'm feeling all right. Um, I'm about to talk about a bunch of child abuse, which I'm not really looking forward to doing. Uh, Sadie, how about you? I'm feeling about as good as a person can be when they have to talk about horrible things. Uh, Shoshana, before we get into the episode, do you want to just give us your professional qualifications um, and, and just explain to the listeners who, who you are and why you're on this show with us talking about this book? Absolutely. So I uh, found you guys just listening to podcasts and a while back you had asked about a possible listener who had any mental health qualifications to help review a different book. And I volunteered myself on the Facebook group because it sounded like an interesting prospect. And so we did that. And then um, Gavi and I actually had a chance to get together in person on um, Christmas Eve this past year. It was Hanukkah. Yeah. And now we're back again to go into a topic that is actually right in the center of my professional wheelhouse. I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Massachusetts. I have both a doctorate in clinical psychology and I have two master's degrees in psychology. Wow. I, yeah, work with children every day in one of the areas that I spend a lot of time doing is working to help with what we call parent training. So helping parents who are struggling to figure out the most effective way to help their children be successful. And so that really fits in well with reviewing the book that we're doing today. Well, thank you so much for being here. And if I'm correct, nothing that you say on this podcast is medical advice, but it's all your professional opinion. Correct. And okay. nothing I am saying should be considered a uh, professional intervention. If you need help with parenting your children or are looking for recommendations, you should talk to your pediatrician about a referral to a mental health professional in your area. All right. Glad we got that information out there. And you are extremely qualified to talk about this subject, which is one of the reasons why I'm so glad to have you on here. So if you'd like to see a lot of video clips of Debbie and Michael Pearl, the authors of this book speaking, the Fundy Fridays video on them is absolutely great. It's from 2020 and it features a lot of Susanna Anderson rebutting the pearls. And you know, on this show, we love our Fundy beef. I also absolutely have to recommend the three part series Ministry of Violence by Tal Levin. It is one of the absolute best resources that exists on the evangelical passion for hitting children. Just unmissable. So the pearls are kind of pre-influencer fundy influencers. They reached fundamentalist families through No Greater Joy Ministries, through which they published the book that we're discussing today, as well as several pro-patriarchy works, starting with Created to Be His Helpmeet, which we will discuss in detail at a later date because I have gotten myself a copy. 
without giving the fundies any money. That sounds scary. That book came in the mail and I just handed it to my husband to get his blind reaction. He he tolerates me. It's very nice of him. <laughs> <laughs> so michael and debbie are from the memphis area they now live in rural tennessee aesthetic wise they are just about the polar opposite of somebody like girl defined they look and sound like people who live in a log cabin in rural tennessee because they are the pearls are not independent they are independent baptist they are less associated with the ifb as a movement they aren't like they aren't hiles camp ifb they aren't affiliated as closely with the national network of loosely connected IFB churches. They live a little bit outside of that, which is to say their beliefs are a little too extreme, even for the mainstream IFB. I would say that their books are read and put into practice in a large number of IFB churches, but the pearls put things too bluntly and say the quiet part out loud. So they aren't quite polished enough for the IFB to openly affiliate with them. It's more of a quiet affiliation. As far as the content of this book, specifically the Pearls advocate both child abuse and spousal abuse. The Pearls practice a very strict version of complementarianism, biblical patriarchy. They believe that the husband is the head of the home, going so far as to call him the king of his home. And they believe that wives must submit to their husbands no matter what and children must obey or else be beaten into submission. The main topics that the Pearls deal with in their ministry are how to discipline children, gender roles, and wives' submission to husbands. Uh, I wanna give you a very small sample of their teachings outside of to train up a child. Debbie and Michael have said that if a wife is being abused by her husband, it is okay for them to separate but never divorce, and they may only separate if her life is in danger. Otherwise, she should stay married to him, submit more, and pray for God to change him. Debbie famously wrote that if a husband is sexually abusing his children, the wife should turn him into the authorities. She should pray that he will get enough jail time, that the children will, will be grown before he gets out. She should stay married to him, take the children to visit him in prison, and be ready to rejoin him as his wife and fully forgive him when he is released. Which is what Anna Duggar seems to currently be trying. They also advocate specific methods by which to, to discipline children, and their methods have been directly linked to the deaths of at least three children whose parents quite literally beat them to death, inspired by the teachings in the book to train up a child. In order to write this book, you have to be like literally an absolute monster. It's... Uh... I, I respect your take on this, and I... I hear how genuinely you hate this book. Oh, I hate this book. It was and awful. I believe you, but it's a little odd for me to hear because this is like my normal life from 20 years ago. Man. Serious question. Um, this is a question for Shoshana, I think. Who's, who is a greater danger to children, Michael and Debbie Pearl or Josh Duggar? So, serious answer. Definitely Josh Duggar it's pretty clear in the literature and even just meeting people that it is a lot harder to recover from sexual abuse than it is to, from physical abuse. The interesting thing about physical abuse is as horrible as it is, there isn't the same fundamental betrayal of a person's like safety in the world there is becomes a pattern to it children can understand how and why and when they might be risking that physical abuse whereas with sexual abuse there's no way to avoid it there's nothing you can do to stop it from happening if you are living in a home with someone who's following the recommendations of the pearls you could in theory learn exactly what to do to avoid being hurt the majority of the time unless you're dealing with a situation where you have a parent who's very much using this as an excuse to just be abusive all the time and then you also know what you're dealing with so sadie uh, uh shoshana what are your guys's overall thoughts on this book having read it i think i'm just too close to this book to I, I don't know i think i'm still too close to it in the time span of my life to have Oh, just a one-shot opinion on it like that. 
I was not trained using the specific tactics in this book. Uh, I was raised as a child by Jack Hiles' parenting book, which has a lot of similarities, but it's not exactly the same. And uh, I certainly was not beaten the way that this book recommends that children be beaten. But I, this is a book that was used to train friends of mine. This is a book that I grew up very familiar with and familiar with the teachings of. So I... <laughs> It, I think it's just, it's not as shocking, unfortunately, to me as it is to others, because none of this is new to me. So I have a few um, initial responses. There are sort of two pieces to the, my response to this. Piece one was this very professional response of, oh, that's why people think it's okay to hit your kid. Because for me, growing up in a household and having all this professional training where the idea of being physical in this manner as a form of consequence just makes no sense. And I couldn't wrap my head around why people did it. I do understand that it, culturally in many cultures, there is some use of physical punishment, but I never understood why people would go to that extreme and so reading this book helped give me some context for that and actually i feel like could help me professionally moving forward understanding when families are coming in looking for a different way of doing things and knowing what their potential background is so that part was really interesting these families may have been told that um and, and this is this is different from certain forms of physical discipline which i still wouldn't advocate i still wouldn't do myself but there, this is this is different in that it is um the pearls will say it's not punishment it's discipline and it, it is uh ritualistically hitting with a bent toward breaking the child's spirit um it is different from you did something you shouldn't have done and your punishment is the fact that you're going to feel some pain. Um, I don't like that parenting theory. I don't use that parenting theory, but this is not, you did something you shouldn't have and now you're gonna feel pain. This is a completely different thing. The other thing I wanted to speak to Shoshana, the people who come in uh, to see you and they're looking for a way to discipline their children without hitting. Um, this book says over and over that hurting your children in this way is the only method to turn out the product that you want a uh, an abused child yeah right <laughs> but a, a compliant religious child who will do the right thing for the rest of their adult life right. and i think a lot of parents are kind of scaremongered into using this kind of tactics because they hear this is not only the best way to raise your child this is the only way to guarantee you get what you want and then of course this spirals off into these children in adulthood will often go low contact go no contact with their parents turn into some sort of human that the parents don't approve of and then the parents feel a sense of betrayal because well i did everything right i followed the book i followed the only guaranteed method why did i not get the outcome that i wanted with my child or they feel like failures because mm -hmm. they're like, well, I thought I did everything right, but my kid turned out this way. So obviously I didn't do it right, mm -hmm. which is really an interesting piece because, you know, we're reading this book that's essentially advocating child abuse, but the book is really talking to parents about their own failures as parents if they don't do it this way. And like with the other book that we had reviewed together, there's a very clear message of you're screwing up unless it's X, Y, and Z that I write here. And it just leaves anyone reading this to feel totally belittled and- They're almost like negging you into doing their, exactly. their thing. Exactly. Yeah. Cause, cause when my take from this, um, and I guess, cause you know, I just wasn't raised in this kind of culture. It's, it's, I, sometimes when i go into material like this i forget to put myself in that mindset it seems just like the on one hand there's the purpose of i need to raise these kids to be good and godly and, and to to 
live as as like upstanding good people when they're adults there is also the sub purpose of you 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 have a million kids so you need to make them as not inconvenient to you as possible like you need to make (laughs) like you need to make it so that, that like you have so many kids they're hard to look after you need to make them just like do what you say so you only have to ask them once because you can't be wrangling 50 kids you know it's like herding cats um i can barely wrangle one toddler (laughs) yeah i mean you you know like if you just said chuck go to go take a nap and then she was just like okay and then she goes and (laughs) sleeps for two hours your life would be so much easier our podcasting would be so much easier but that's not how it works when you have a kid but there's also the 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 third level of this which i just didn't which, which i just have to wrap my head around is just how image conscious and how obsessively image cr- conscious um th- these christian uh, uh, fundamentalists can be that like they, i i would say that they're as image conscious or even possibly more image conscious as any like los angeles influencer type person so i guess it makes sense but it just seems to me like it's not like this book is like getting plastic surgery that looks good on Instagram, but it makes it so your face doesn't move properly. And so when people see you in real life and see you speak, they think you look weird. Like that's too much Botox. Yeah. Just, like it looks good on Instagram. You Like if you put the right TikTok filter on, then you look like a, a supermodel. But like, if they see you in real life, you're just like, why is that person's face just like not moving? Appearance is everything with the fundamentalist, because I'm sure we've talked about this before, but if you raise a child and then um, your child dyes their hair blue, gets a lot of tattoos and cusses online, hypothetically, that child is a shame to your family. You are openly gossiped about in church. Well, what do you think Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so did wrong with their child? And other people will talk about what specifically they think that your parenting failures were. You lose face in your community if your child misbehaves as a child or if they turn into a kind of adult that you did not want them to become. Well, that's also an aspect of cult control the, as, as part of the bite model is, is the socially enforced um, and, and like everything based on status. That is definitely a, a, a sub method of cult control. I don't know. Is that information control or thought control or emotion control or behavior? I can't remember which one that would. It fall. might be it, a middle of the Venn diagram thing. Yeah, it's, it might be two or three. Shoshana, did you have a, a a second point on this book that you didn't get to yet? I did, and you actually just led straight into it very interestingly, because my second point had to do with the B on the bite model behavior control, because this is like the end all be all of behavior control. What I found really interesting about this book is the pearls seem to really get where and why things go wrong with some families' parenting styles. It is their recommendations on how to fix it that is like, it's not like taking a left turn, it's like digging a hole into the ground. And they understand parts of these concepts from behavior theory and conditioning, but every single recommendation they make is exactly the opposite of we kn- of what we know is successful from a behavioral theory perspective and that part i kind of found really interesting that they managed to be so right and so completely wrong at the exact same time i feel like that's going to become a theme <laughs> it it is and it's a theme, a theme throughout the whole book and what i find so insidious about the book is because they get the initial parts on target, a parent could easily read this book and say, oh my God, that's exactly what I do. And it isn't working. They're right. Which, you know, someone came into my office, I'd probably be on board with that piece. It is the next step, their recommendation for what to do instead, which is so toxic and so dangerous. And frankly, so ineffective from a behavior theory perspective so it's not like with bill gothard when he's like uh teen suicide is caused by rejection of the design principle 
and you need to like where it's like that right it's not just just totally made up with no basis in reality and he'll just like say whatever like write down whatever pops into his head these people have clearly like studied they just think that the remedy for everything is just to beat the out of children which is they get the problem mostly right and the solution 100 percent wrong yeah Correct. it's oh man it's like the the people who are like well the solution to every economic problem every time is just cut taxes like mm -hmm. just, just should we go on down to the introduction of the book or do we have anything else we need to get into before that no let's get into the actual content of it so i can read the first passage that we highlighted uh, i don't think we'll have time to read every highlighted passage but i can start us off with this one the the very first lines of this book read this book is not about discipline nor problem children. The emphasis is on the training of a child before the need to discipline arises. It is apparent that most parents never attempt to train a child to obey. They, rate, they wait until the child becomes unbearable and then explode. This is one of exactly one of these concepts or statements that fit with what I was saying earlier, where this last line of they wait until the child becomes unbearable and then explode, I think can really ring true to a lot of parents. But I would disagree with the first sentence. This book is absolutely about discipline. It is all about discipline. I find it interesting that he differentiates discipline from training. And I guess one could argue that there is a difference, but that's not how he's recommending things to. So. Well, from what I can tell, discipline is when you beat your child after they do something wrong. And training is when you beat your child before they do something wrong. Right. <laughs> yeah, that, that pretty much seems to be it. Or you set your child up so you have an excuse to beat them, which is a common theme in this book. Which is unfortunate because as we're going to talk about, I'm sure later on, children absolutely need to be trained. They just don't need to, you know, you, you train a child on this is how you brush your teeth and this is how you use the bathroom and this is how you walk on the sidewalk instead of running into traffic. But so, training does not mean hitting. <laughs> so quick sidebar, the term train is not something I have historically heard used for human children. That's an interesting point here. Well, the <laughs> Michael Pearl says, these are the same principles the Amish use to train their stubborn mules. Again, human children. I have he heard the term train with some frequency around non-human um, mammals. Dogs, horses. Yep, yeah. mules. Mules, yep. See, that's, that's interesting because I was continually compared to a young horse growing up. The, the IFB child training philosophy is if you want to so you've got a young horse who's never had a saddle on or been trained to walk with a plow or a cart or whatever it is you want the horse to pull and they would go into extended metaphors about the first time you try to saddle a horse they kick and they jump all over the place and they can really injure you in the process if you're not careful and there is a lot of um unpleasantness that leads to a horse being ready to take a saddle and then eventually take a rider and then eventually pull a cart or a carriage or whatever it is that you wanted to pull well but it doesn't have to be that way you can also do it in a manner that's not so terrifying to the horse yeah the fundies don't know that <laughs> or you can just get a car like a or get like a tractor well the amish can't get a car and there's a lot of talk about amish for a fundy book all right. Are we ready to go to chapter one? Do we have anything left for the introduction? No, that's kind of it. Um, uh, chapter one of this book, chapter one of To Train Up a Child, title of the first chapter, switch your kids. Switch them with what? I don't know. Uh, a plow horse, <laughs> a dog. Uh, uh, no, one of those TV shows where you switch your kids with another family, obviously. Or it's like freaky. It, 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 you want to right. freaky Friday your kids. <laughs> Get like Lindsay Lohan and... Uh, <laughs> just what they want to raise a bunch of yeah. Lindsay Lohans. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. So there's this, there's a quote here. I want to read, this is the first quote in the book. I think horribly offensive. It says, when you tell some parents that they need to switch their children, they respond. I would, if I could find someone willing to trade, ha 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 joke. 
I have had children in my house that would be enough to give an electric wheat grinder a nervous breakdown. I don't know what an electric wheat grinder looks like, but the parents look like escapees from a Second World War Polish boxcar. Another hour with them, and I would have been searching for the yellow pages for discount vasectomies. This is so horribly offensive to me as a Jewish person. No, this is this is just horribly offensive. Don't compare things to the Holocaust. Uh, just don't <laughs> jack scob compared teen suicide to uh basketball players wearing track suits uh, yeah that was yeah. a weird moment in his book and it's not to say that like the world war ii holocaust is the only holocaust that has happened in world history don't compare anything to a holocaust like any holocaust there's like literally yeah. hey man these people their their kids are unruly uh, they look like they survived the genocide. What? <laughs> or they look like they're on their way to a death camp. And this is like, this is what? also, I think, serves a purpose to demonize and dehumanize unruly children. Yeah. Because using this very extreme and really inappropriate comparison, it's meant to give you pity for these poor parents whose kids are not behaving in the way that the parent wants them to. And that is a, that's a horrible comparison to make to a child as well. Because I think a lot of this book is uh, adultifying and dehumanizing children so that you will feel okay about hitting them. Yes. I mean, there's one um, example in here that I thought was really interesting. They, they said that they went to... Um, I don't know what country it was, but it was it was a missions trip country, and they were talking to the local natives there who taught who who were saying basically that they were able to potty train their children at like four or six weeks old. Yeah, that's a real thing. The the message that I got from that was like these kids when they're like six weeks old, they're able to understand X Y Z concept, so you shouldn't feel bad about punishing them when they do that thing wrong. Right. And if you haven't managed to figure out how to toilet train your kid by six weeks, then you're doing something wrong. Yeah. Which is developmentally ridiculous. So I want to move on to, speaking of developmentally ridiculous, I want to move on to our next highlighted quote. It's the bottom of page five in our doc. Pearl is talking about a family that's doing things right, whose kids are almost completely self-sufficient. And he says that these children, the, the mom came over to talk to Debbie and these children went in the other room and played together and quote, don't expect attention when one turns the rocking horse over and gets a knot on her head. This, this really stuck out to me because I want my child to run to me when she's been injured, because that is how I know that I'm her safe space and her safe person and that she knows that I'll always be there for her. Yeah, that's a sign of a good attachment relationship. If a parent doesn't look to, or a child, I apologize, a child does not look to their parent for comfort when they get injured, that really speaks volumes about the child's feeling that they can get their needs met from their parent. And or, I should say, there could be other developmental issues going on. If you as a parent are available for your kid, when they harm or hurt themselves, you are doing something right, not wrong. Well, it, it just seems to me like what I was saying in the beginning, that this is just made to be, to make children as not inconvenient as possible. You injured yourself. Oh, well, why are you bothering me with this bullshit? I have more important things to think about than this. As much as the Christian fundamentalists like to say, oh, right, raising your family right is the most important thing that you can possibly do in this world. It seems to me like there's so many aspects of raising your family right that people do that that people you know really spend a lot of time and, and effort and emotion and and really put themselves into that these people literally just can't be bothered with. It's also telling parents that their natural instincts are wrong. And there's a lot in this book that talks to parents about, oh, you are doing this it's totally the wrong way to react, but what they're talking 
about is actually a very natural parenting instinct to protect their child. That's evolutionary. Parents of all species evolutionarily have been selected to care for their young. <laughs> like you need to care for your child. And everything about this book is like the antithesis of that. But of course, the fundies don't believe in evolution, so. Well, also, it seems to me like like what you were saying with that is that the idea of caring for your child, so much of it feels like it's trying to rationalize and like give you the mental tools that you need to steal yourself enough that you would be willing to actually commit horrible acts of abuse against your own child, which is something that is kind of hardwired in your brain that you're not supposed to do. Like you see your own child and you think I need to protect this thing. And this book seems to me like it's also written to give you the mental tools that you need to get around that, to, to like get around that, like do not do this in your own mind so that you will be willing to do that. So this book is almost as much about training parents as it is about training children in that regard. I agree. I think a lot of this book is about training parents to react the wrong way. So let's talk about training. I want to read our next quote because we have to keep moving through this book. Unfortunately, <laughs> training does not necessarily require that the trainee be capable of reason. Even mice and rats can be trained to respond to stimuli. Careful training can make a dog perfectly obedient. If a seeing eye dog can be trained to reliably lead a blind man through the obstacles of a city street, shouldn't a parent expect more out of an intelligent child? Wow. But they don't do it through beating. I mean, anyone who knows how service dogs are trained is all through positive reinforcement. I mean, you can train a fish to go to the top of a fishbowl, but that's because you're the bringer of food. And when your face shows up, or your hand shows up, that means food is coming. So they learn to connect you to the food positively. And they know that if they see you, they should come up to the top of the bowl because food is coming. But that doesn't mean that the term training can be thrown around in such a willy nilly way. It does have to have thought behind it. Right. I mean, there's no need to use any sort of negative reinforcement or punishment in order to effectively teach your child how to be a good and successful human in the world. Especially because every kid I've ever met loves making their parent happy or making their parent laugh. Um, Chuck absolutely loves, <laughs> she might grow up to be a comedian, she loves making people laugh. That's like her, her primary goal in life. Oh, that's is really adorable at that To age. make people laugh. She, she'll do anything to get, especially her grandparents uh, or her aunts and uncles, she'll do anything to get that big laugh. Um, children, children love to be praised. Children love to make you laugh. Children love to make you smile. There is just, there's no reason to use negative enforcement when po positive enforcement is so powerful. Absolutely. The reason people turn to punishment or negative reinforcement is because they don't recognize the need to provide that positive praise for all the little things that they like seeing their kid doing. So if your child is sitting nicely at the table, you're just relieved they're doing it and may forget to tell them, good job for sitting so nicely at the table. Mm -hmm. A child is beaming every time they are told that they've done something right. What happens is as they get older, if they don't get that positive reinforcement for what is successful, they just learn to look for a response from their parent in any way. And sometimes they get into this really negative pattern of doing whatever it takes to get, get, to get a reaction out of their exhausted parent. And the only thing that works is negative behavior. And I don't want to over blame parents on this because um what i've noticed is that it's it's more effort absolutely it, it's it, more upfront effort yes and i i want to be careful how i phrase this but it is it is harder to raise a kid without hitting them like seriously 
I have babysat many, many toddlers that were raised with methods similar to the methods in this book or methods that are similar but somewhat gentler. It is harder. And now I'm raising a kid that, that I do not hit. And it is, it is actually harder to get a toddler to do things without using that negative reinforcement. I absolutely think it's worth it. I intend to continue doing it. But it is, it is actually more difficult to get like the immediate response of like the kid is doing what I need the kid to do right now so that I can get out the door and not run 20 minutes late. Absolutely. It is a time investment up front. Mm -hmm. When you're in a busy world and having a busy day and you're completely exhausted and sleep deprived, sometimes the easiest thing is not the right thing, but it works in the moment. Mm -hmm. And that's what people resort to. And what's so upsetting about this book is that it's telling parents, no, 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 you shouldn't be reactive in that way. You should do exactly what you're doing, but do it proactively, mm -hmm. which is disgusting. Like people reactively become physical with their kids out of their own sense of frustration and not feeling like they have the tools to do anything, you do anything else. Mm -hmm. Telling them, oh, you have the tool, just do it first is so twisted. So let's talk about this <clears throat> proactive rather than reactive um, abuse. So Pearl says, if you raise your voice when giving a command to your child, he will learn to associate your tone and decibel level with your intention. If you have so trained him, don't blame him if he ignores your first 13 suggestions, waiting for the fevered pitch to reach the point where he must interpret it to be a real command. So it's sounding like he's saying don't scream at your children but what he's actually saying is you speak to them in this like creepy quiet tone and you expect them to obey on the first time you're not asking them to do something three times four times five times six times and then finally snapping and yelling at them and that's when they obey you are proactively hitting them months or years before this so that they know they have to do what you say the first time no matter what tone you're using right which uh. what's interesting is like every parent has a tone like that tone that they are serious and for some parents it may come before the screaming and some parents who just aren't screamers may not scream and just use the tone and i've met so many kids who have accused their parents of yelling at them when there was absolutely no yelling involved just because the parent was using the tone. But it's not like they have the language to say, you are talking to me in that tone of voice. That means you're being really serious and I don't like it. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's like I didn't raise my voice at you, but. So let's see, where should we go now? Oh, let's, um, let's go to the bottom of page yeah. eight, top of page nine in our doc, because this is where he's going to get into some of the actual methods uh, that would be used to, pro what are we talking about when we talk about proactively training? This is what he means. Place an appealing object where they can reach it. Maybe in a no-no corner or on an apple juice table. That's where the coffee table once sat. Haha. Uh Haha. -huh. Uh -huh. This would be, that would be cute and funny if you were not a horrible child abuser, Michael Pearl. When they spy it and make a dive for it in a calm voice say, no, don't touch it. They will already be familiar with the no, so they will pause, look at you in wonder, and then turn around and grab it. Switch their hand once and simultaneously say no. Remember, you are not disciplining, you are training. One spat with a little switch is enough. They will again pull back their hand and consider the relationship between the object, their desire, the command, and the little reinforcing pain. It may take several times, but if you are consistent, they will learn to consistently obey even in your absence. And this is a precursor to blanket training. This is the same kind of, this is the same concept. So uh, he mm -hmm. says, do this once the child can crawl. And I did look it up. The average age for babies to crawl is nine months old. Mm. Oh, God. Mm. It's one of those situations, Gavi, where there are no words to describe how you feel. Only sounds can like accurately express your innermost feelings in the moment. And of course, like that is the point of our episode recording where my kid has woken up and I hear her little voice with Jonathan out there taking care of her. So just Aww. double heartrending here. I bet. Thanks, Chuck. Great timing. 
I, I, I have things that I could say, but not things that I like would say on a podcast where other people might hear me say them. So you're just saying them in your head. <laughs> What's really interesting about this particular paragraph, I mean, separate from the fact that in in the state of Massachusetts, this would be illegal. You are not allowed to hit someone with an object in the state of Massachusetts. I find it really humorous that the pearls think that, like, the theory that they're espousing is novel because this, theor- this theory of continual practice in this manner is applied behavior analysis, which is the most empirically supported treatment to t- teach skills to children on the autism spectrum. The major difference is you don't do it by hitting them. You do it the opposite way. You like, okay, so there's something on the table they're not supposed to touch. You give them something on the table that they are supposed to use. And every time they do use it, you make a big deal. Uh, No, I'm just making sounds. Again, I've always felt like there is a point in a person's emotional world or words no longer reflect how you feel, you only have sounds to express. But like one of the, okay, so one of the big things that I'm really proud of having, and I keep using this word training, and I'm sorry, but that's like the terminology we're working with today. But one of the things that I'm really proud that I've trained Chuck to do at such a young age is to walk really well. She's great in parking lots, sidewalks, that sort of thing. And uh, her godmother has helped with this because her godmother is an angel. Um, but we've gotten her where she can consistently walk down a sidewalk with me. She'll stand on the inside, like further from the road, hold my hand, walk on the side, not not do anything unpredictable. Uh, She's also fantastic in parking lots. She gets out of the car. (laughs) She mostly stands right where I put her. Um, I did try the put your hand on the spot trick and then I realized my gas tank's on the wrong side for where her car seat is. (laughs) (laughs) So I did did try that, Um, but I, Like, that's something that I feel like I've had success in teaching her to do. And you know how I did that? Practice. Like, that that concept of practice is exactly how I was able to get her to do that. I got her in in low stakes situations, like a, a very, very little used city street that has sidewalks. And we practiced there before we practiced on a busier street where there might be moving cars. I practiced in empty parking lots. I waited until we were in a parking lot that was very empty, a very low traffic time of day to practice doing the way she needs to do to be safe. So that concept of practice is exactly what you need to do, just the opposite of what Michael Pearl is recommending here. Which is his whole, the whole book. I mean, that is the whole book. And the whole like point of what I said at the beginning, where he gets the beginning part right, but then his recommendation about how to achieve the goal is just the opposite of what you really should be doing. I think it just it irks me because of the whole concept of this book that this is the only way. This is the only way to get the outcome that you want, which in in the example I just gave is your child behaving safely in places with moving cars. He'll tell you this is the only way to get what you want. And I think it really irks me now that I I know for a fact, because I have done it, that you can do this a different way. So um, the next, there's a section here uh, that I think is kind of related to this because we're talking about um, getting children not to touch. And, and, and training them for, for specific behaviors. The, the section that comes immediately after this is the section that's uh, called plant your tree in the garden. And I want to, um, and, and there's some quotes in here from, from Genesis. Um, uh, uh, one quote from him real quick, and then talk about basically my interpretation of this section. Um, the quote here where is where he okay. says, um, some people say child proof your home. And I say home proof your child which is essentially what he's talking about up above. But what the implication here is that uh, with the title of this section, uh, which is plant your tree in the garden, he's essentially saying, cause, cause the, the story in the book of Genesis that keeps popping up in this book that he keeps using throughout this section, throughout other sections is basically their thesis is that uh, uh, 
due to Adam and Eve eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, mankind has an inherent sin nature. This is a, 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 a common belief within this is that that isn't an uncommon belief that's a very uh, mainstream belief but what he's saying is when god when god placed adam and eve in the garden with the tree he did not place the tree out of reach therefore god was testing them and also attempting to train the sin nature out of adam and eve is kind of what he's saying here um, therefore, by extrapolation, if God had used Michael and Debbie Pearl's method of training his children, then the fall of man would not have happened. So essentially, what they're saying is that they're training their children to prepare them to be sinless as man was in the garden, which is blasphemous. Like th- That feels extremely blasphemous to me um, because according to Christianity – nobody was sinless except for jesus this is just a, a truly like if if you like take this theory and this point that and this example that he's using to its logical conclusion then it just goes to a very weird and crazy place he's also kind of saying basically well we're better parents to our children than god was to man because our children obey us and man doesn't obey god and also, going with Michael and Debbie Pearl's recommendation, what God should have been doing was slapping Adam and Eve every time they yeah. got close to that tree. Just, like, place some thorns around it, but yeah. he didn't. No, you're right. That is an <clears throat> extremely weird theological take. I don't even know if they understand that that's the theological take that they're making, but they're just like, yeah, this is a... a, a an uh, example that we can throw in this book out about parenting it makes sense but then they don't take like they don't take that extra step to actually think about these things yeah they're not um they're not saying oh we want to raise sinless children but i can tell you from my personal experience with this style of parenting it's about raising children that quote unquote sin as little as possible the idea is that a child disobeying should be an aberration an unusual happening in your home which doesn't seem healthy i mean how do you learn if you don't make mistakes you don't learn you just get trained to behave a certain way every time yeah i don't know maybe that's where they up i guess like if god had done blanket training then we'd all still be in the garden <laughs> so true <laughs> this is so fucking wild like th- this th- this uh Oh, man. Okay, do we want to move on to the next section? Yeah, let's move on to touchy situations and biting babies. This is this is sad. We this is this next section is really sad. So he's he's next describing a situation that I think every parent has probably experienced as well as anybody who's ever held a baby has experienced Um, when when little ones pull on your take off your glasses pull on your hair bite things that shouldn't be bitten etc uh so i'll I'll read this uh this quote here get set for training hold him where he can easily reach your glasses look him right in the eye he reaches out don't pull back don't defend yourself calmly say no if anything lower your voice don't raise it don't sound more serious than usual Remember you are establishing a pattern of command to be used the rest of his youth. When he touches the glasses, again say no and accompany your command with minor pain. He will pull his hand back and try to comprehend the association of grabbing the glasses and pain. No. No, no, no. No, this is a little bait little baby. They're literally trying to figure out motor skills. And he describes Like he describes this minor pain as I usually just thumped their little hand with my index finger. And and the thing, the thing is that tapping someone's hand with your index finger doesn't cause pain. Um, even a little, even a little baby does not, even a, a little newborn baby tapping their hand with your finger. I don't see any way that that could cause pain. So I don't feel like he's being fully honest about what he is doing to tiny chubby baby hands here i don't know maybe he's like flicking them maybe although that doesn't sound like a good idea the little hands are delicate yeah it's just i don't like a little tiny baby hands this is a, a truly like mind-bendingly 
I I don't even know. Like I I don't understand how like if you hold a baby, like you look at this thing, it, it, like the it's like a brain thing that just says no harm shall come to this child that is in my hands. That that is like the primary instinct when you hold a baby. It's and to uh, I don't like the amount of like mental energy that you have to put into overriding that and to just be willing to and and just to be so okay with overriding that mental thing so easily and so nonchalantly just really gives me the ick factor again no words here i also feel like he's missing the point that there is a natural consequence for little babies especially like if they let's say are start biting my my nephew went through a phase where he was biting my sister's chin every time they were like holding him in a particular position. And he learned not to do it because she would say, ow, and pull away. And she wouldn't necessarily be so quiet about the ow because it was a natural response. And that mm -hmm. is what helps teach the baby that they shouldn't do it anymore because their parent gave them an unexpectedly loud response and pulled away from them. They lost the social connection. You don't have to stay quiet and cause them physical harm you are just honest with them about how you feel yeah it's it's because you know i don't advocate yelling at small babies but yelling in pain or or speaking out you know speaking loudly in pain is not yelling at your child it's your own response i think um when i first when i had a t uh, under one baby so about a year ago i was originally under the impression that i wasn't allowed to yell in pain if she accidentally hurt me and that was so triggering because that felt like emotion control and that triggered a lot of responses from being in the ifb and having to control emotions and then i learned more about natural consequences and if you hurt someone else accidentally or intentionally, the natural consequence is usually that they will vocalize their pain. And move away from you because it's and unpleasant. Move away from you. So if a, if a baby accidentally um, you know, bonks you with their head, I had a big head bonker. Um, Chuck's just got, she's just Maybe got a she's big, gonna be a soccer player. A football player. Yeah, she's just, She's just got a big head and didn't quite know how to control it when she was little. <laughs> so I had, a, I got a few split lips uh, along the way. Or like when she would pull your hair. Yeah, uh, that was more like that was more her experimenting. Her little, her head bongs were just like she had a giant head and a tiny neck and couldn't quite control it Aww. as well as well as she thought she could when she was, you know, three four months old. And she did split my lip a couple times. But what I learned is, um, it's. It, be, it, reacting in pain or vocalizing pain in an appropriate way is not uh, yelling at your child and your child learns, oh, I should be more careful where I put my giant hard skull <laughs> or I should not pull mom's hair or I should not pull mom's earrings or whatever because when I do that, she reacts in pain and moves away. Uh, this, he also talks about um, nursing parents who have babies who bite the the and this is it's pretty like, awful uh my well, wife did many not... babies sorry i think you know when you go from not having teeth to having teeth you don't necessarily recognize that you're biting right and also the baby can be teething right and biting for comfort and the baby has no way of knowing that that hurts the right point. my wife did not waste time finding a cure when the baby bit she pulled hair understand the baby is not being punished just conditioned uh, okay, no. that this is, is so legit punishment <laughs> that is so sad and it also just teaches i feel like this this is my uh sadie crackpot theory and i may or may not be right because i'm not the expert on this podcast recording but i feel like this sets up an unhealthy pattern of relationships that can continue throughout a kid's life well because what you've taught the kid is if you hurt me then i will hurt you and then it teaches the kid i should hurt you if you hurt me right and i my my little pet theory is 
that this turns out adults who are in adult romantic partnerships where they do the tit for tat. Well, you did this, so I'm going to do that. And then you did this to get me back. And now I'm going to do something else to get you back. Where the, the, they see intimate relationships as you got me, so I'm going to get you. And, and that's what people who love each other do. Yeah, you're yes. totally right. Well, I'm glad my, I'm glad my theory is correct. You have a long history of figuring out psychology on your own, though. She literally had to figure it out. Psychology yeah. was banned. Yeah. It was illegal. It's against the rules. Right. Unfortunately, like most of my, my good inventions, somebody else did come up with it first. But you still did it independently. But yeah, that's that's just kind of what I see. And I've known people who are like that in their romantic relationships. I've had friends who will text me about, you know, my partner did this and what do I need? To, what should I do to get them back? And I really do think this kind of like give and take. novel idea. Talk to them about it. Yeah. The next section that I really wanted to talk to, let's let's do this section, then we'll go to break. OK, that okay. sounds great. OK, Um. so this next section is called Come When I Call You, and I'm going to read this passage out. And he says, one father tells of his training sessions with each new toddler. He sets aside an evening for booty camp. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Boot, no like that's funny because like booty boot camp is like a thing that the, is like a class they offer at the gym yeah um, right yeah <laughs> like to tone yeah. your rear end <laughs> yeah trying to trying to do like a, a squats and like a, a, a like kicks and stuff and, and like daddy's deadlifts i don't know anyway um which it, it but it, it sets aside an evening for booty camp which is boot camp for toddlers the child of 10 to 12 months is left alone to be deeply interested in a toy or some delightful object from across the room or just inside the other room. The father calls the child. If he ignores the call, the father goes to him and explains the necessity of immediately coming when called and then leads him to the father's chair. The child thus led through these paces is being programmed. No hitting in this one, which is, uh, I guess, cool. Um, he is returned to the toy and left alone long enough again to become engrossed another call and if no response the father gives a patient explanation and demonstration of the desired response the parent having assured himself of the child's understanding once again sets up the situation and calls the child this time if there is not an immediate response the child is lightly spanked and lectured oh there is hitting okay lightly spanked and lectured the father continues this throughout the evening until the child re readily and immediately responds when summons thereafter until the child leaves the home, he is expected to drop everything and come upon the first call. As long as parents remain consistent, the child will consistently obey. This obedience training is carried out in the most utmost patience and concentration. The spanking should not be viewed as punishment, but, at, um, but as reinforcement to commands. Uh, this is a lot. This is actually very common in Fundy World. The the you drop whatever you're doing and come when your parents call. That's something that practically everybody that I know is raised with. If my parents did this shit to me, I would get so mad. Like honestly, like I'm. I think of like this child training as like the reverse of what would happen in real life. Like you guys, you guys have both worked in corporate offices, right? Yeah. Um. A little bit, yeah. Yeah, Sadie. I mean, you you've worked in corporate offices. Yeah. Uh, you guys have have you guys ever had like a boss or a coworker who will call you into their office to discuss something that really could have been answered in like like they literally could have sent you a Slack message and then you could have answered it right away and but they called you into their office for it and now that person like wants a word and you now you just like ignore them because you're like oh this is just some bullshit send me a slack message if you really want to talk to me because like i feel like that's the response that you get out of this is that like oh my parents calling me for something it's probably not important because he just wants me to come when called i'm what i'm doing right now is probably more important than whatever he wants I just feel like this is a good place to point out that the training described here really lines up with the fundamentalist view of god a uh, fundamentalist god set us up to fail and is now just always waiting for us to mess up so that he can punish us yeah this is i mean this is just like also like i had undiagnosed adhd from when i was a kid so if you like set me up and i'm just like 
chilling with a toy and you distract me from something and you just like call me for some bullshit and just like distract me from whatever it is I'm doing for like three seconds just because you need to like ask me a question and it's something that you could have asked me later or at any other time but you had to do it now that like really just pisses me off so much like there's there's few things that I find more annoying than when somebody just decides oh I'm going to completely disrespect whatever it is that you might be doing right now because I need a word right now for something that's really not important it just feels like it's the most selfish and and ridiculous behavior and if you engage in that kind of behavior then I like well this is probably why the fundies tend to conceptualize ADHD as not being real and as being a sin problem yeah you know, I do see plenty of parents who get frustrated that their kids don't respond to them in what they feel like is a timely enough way. And the reality is, I remind the parents that, like, the child is in the middle of something and, like, there's an issue of perspective taking that you need to consider when you call your kid. You need to give them a chance to comply with the request and that it might take them a second to pull themselves together and come down. What is a reasonable expectation is for them to respond to you that they heard and that they're on their way. But also if you have a kid who has ADHD or poor time management skills, they might think that they've complied very quickly and it took them 45 minutes. Again, this is one of those things, there's a piece of it that is like on target in terms of like, yes, parents expect their kids to comply immediately, but the answer is not to train your child to comply immediately the answer is to like give your kid a little grace and let them respond in a reasonable amount of time i think what i've seen from this with friends of mine who have grown up uh potentially neurodivergent and fundy is that it tends to result in these kids living in a constant state of hypervigilance because yeah. if the parent calls and they don't hear the parent for whatever reason, they were focusing on something else, they were not um, physically able to hear, the parent wasn't loud enough, What whether they were prevented from responding to the parent by some external circumstance, whatever it is that happened, they will be punished. So this, I've seen this result in a lot of hypervigilance because the kid must be able to hear the parent whenever they call no matter what so that they can snap out of whatever they're doing and respond quickly in order to not get hurt mm -hmm. and i've seen this lead to sleep disturbances because the kid is afraid that the parent's going to call them in the middle of the night and they have to be able to respond quickly um i've seen this result in some just really nasty things because the the kid is like living in flight or fight fight or flight mode yeah. So on that lovely note, let's go take up the offering. And when we come back, we will keep going through this horrible book. Hello, listeners. My name is Casey, host of the Cult Vault podcast, a long format interview based show that focuses on cults, high demand groups, captive organizations and more. Each week, I interview a different cult survivor who brings a story of coercion and exploitation along with their own fight for freedom. With nearly 200 survivor interviews from all over the world, you can also find deep dives into infamous cults, interviews with leading experts in the field, and understand more about how cults exist all around us and none of us are safe. Each month, I feature a different author on the show who has penned a compelling memoir about their cult experiences which we discuss at length on the show, with copies of their books available to listeners. You will never be short of insightful and moving content here at the Cult Vault Podcast, available on all major platforms. Hey, Sadie here. If this is your first time listening to the Leaving Eden podcast, make sure you go back and check out episode 57. It's a primer episode for new listeners. That episode tells my personal story and gives you all the terms and information that you'll need to know going forward. Also, check out our cult true crime series, The First Family of Fundamentalism, so that you can get the whole cult story. If you like our show, you can support us by joining our Patreon, where we have extended and uncensored episodes, as well as other bonus content available. You can also join in the discussion in our Facebook group, that group is called Eden Exodus. Tell a friend, tell a family member, tell your worst enemy. The Leaving Eden podcast is a fully independent podcast, and we really appreciate your support. Now, back to the show. 
we are back from our break um we, i mean we've basically we've only gotten through like the first chapter of this book so far uh if that that's okay we were we were never gonna have time to systematically go through every toxic thing in this book i do feel like we've hit a majority of the concepts of this book so what we're gonna do we're gonna do a few more toxic quotes and then we're going to talk more about the what the effects of this book might be on a person yeah um so I, I just one real quick thing uh one of the names of the section the the next section be after the one that we were just talking about before the break is never too young to train which i would like to point out that michael and debbie pearl agree with r kelly that age ain't nothing but a number so the next section i want to talk about is it's called steps to obedience he talks about um so i'll quote this one of our girls who developed mobility early had a fascination with crawling up the stairs at four months, she was too unknowing to be punished for disobedience. But for her own good, we attempted to train her not to climb the stairs by coordinating the voice command of no with little spats on the bare legs. The switch was a 12 inch long, 1 8 inch diameter sprig from a willow tree. Uh, such was her fascination with climbing that four or five sessions had not made her stop. The thought of further spankings was disconcerting. Oh, really? You didn't like that idea? So I conceived an alternative. After one more spanking, I laid the switch on the bottom step. We later observed her crawl to the stairs and start the ascent only to halt at the first step and stare at the switch. She backed off over. She backed off and never again attempted to climb the stairs even after the switch was removed. That's f I, I have two responses. Well, I probably have two responses and then a third probably. Response one is they make these really cool things called baby gates. Super useful with stairs. Just throwing that out there. But we didn't child proof our home. We home proofed our <laughs> oh, child. Right. This is okay. insane. Because I would rather beat my kid than install a simple safety device to keep them right. safe. There's this meme that goes around the internet every Christmas of this Christmas tree with a bunch of oranges, like kind of just placed around it because apparently the cat in that house is afraid of oranges. And so it keeps him from like <laughs> climbing up and attacking the Christmas tree. And that just made me think of that. Um, aside from the fact that like, they're like, Oh, my four month old was uh, walking upstairs or climbing upstairs. Like my kid can climb stairs is the type of thing that most parents that I know would take a vivid, uh, like a video of and send it to every person that they're friends with and get super excited about this developmental milestone. Right. When Chuck, first, when your daughter first started to walk, you were like, oh my God, she's walking. Let me send you this video of her walking. And like for, you know, a week, there was just tons of videos on my phone that you would send me of, of your daughter walking. And they were cute. And I was just like, wow, I'm so happy for her. What a, what a sweet little kid. She's so cute. Michael and Debbie Pearl are using the, like a developmental milestone that you should be excited about as an excuse to do terrorism against their own children. This is insane. This is like truly psychotic. I will say it is scary when your kid figures out how to climb stairs. Yeah, that was what my air was. Cause it's like a whole new world of safety awareness with you. Yeah, now it's vertical right. safety awareness. <laughs> I also feel like I sorta of doubt a four month old was climbing stairs. I mean, I don't, I don't think so. Chuck did all of Chuck's like major uh, motor skills milestones were a little bit early. Um, I think most most babies will get one will be a little early in one area and a little late in another area. Just, you know, the early side of average and the late side of average. Right, they're working on one thing before the other. Yeah, as far as gross motor skills, fine motor skills and verbal skills, most kids that I've known have been a little bit ahead in one of those areas and a little bit behind in another. Yeah. Chuck was always right on the milestone target with fine motor skills, but ahead in gross motor skills and a little bit behind in verbal skills. And now she's kind of evened out and is right on target in all of those. But she, um, I don't remember what month she crawled, but she walked at 10 months, which is yeah, pretty so it's early. like the earliest anyone ever really ever walked. And I didn't um incur I didn't even encourage it. I was trying to prevent her from walking because it not prevent. I was not encouraging her to walk early because it is a whole new world of safety. Um and babies don't really there's no benefit to doing those skills ahead of schedule. But she I, she did not crawl at four months. And she was 
incredibly early to walk, incredibly early to run, uh, jumping off the floor with both feet. She also did exceptionally early. And there are babies who climb before they crawl. My sister was one of them. I can't see a kid crawling at four no, months. And I also climbing. cannot imagine switching a four month old for any possible reason. Like when Chuck was, that makes me so sad. Like when Chuck was four months old, she was basically spherical and squishy. And we called her the potato baby because she was shaped like an adorable potato. And like, I cannot imagine. The thing that I do think about is that there is a little bit of like one upmanship within like the, the Christian fundamentalism that I've seen with like mm. all of our kids are above average. Well, um, there are a lot of parents who are like that. Yeah, but I've, I've definitely seen it in fundamentalism where they're just like, cause, cause it goes with their whole ethos of our, this, we raise our children the right way and the, the old school mm -hmm. way. And that produces the best results. And our results are like miraculously good, uh, because God is blessing our family for, for doing things the right way. So our kid is walking and, um, and repeating Bible verses at eight months old, like uh, uh, the sayings of Spurgeon. So let's go on to our next thing that's on page 42 of our doc. Shoshana, do you want to read the, the quote that you wanted to talk about? Absolutely. This whole thing starts actually on page 40, I apologize, with um, the beginning of the chapter five. The very nature of the child makes the rod an indispensable element in child training and discipline. We will summarize the previous comments on the nature of a child from chapter two and then draw some important practical applications. It goes on to really talk about, well, it throws in a lot of Bible verses and then kind of reinforces this concept of being proactive in beating your child so that they don't learn the wrong things. And it dawned on me that the approach that the pearls are recommending actually inhibits our moral development. There was a um, psychologist named Lawrence Kohlberg who developed six stages of moral development, all the way from punishment and obedience to the final stage of universal ethical, which would mean because it's the right thing to do, essentially. So stage one is like, if I mess this up then i get punished and it, it hurts exactly okay and so the last stage is is it's the right thing what are the ones in between that so stage two and i think this is another piece that i realized as i was thinking this through this is what the fundies fear stage two is referred to as instrumental relativist but what it really means is do what feels good to you and the, huh. yeah well that's very unfundy ish right so I feel like this whole book is espousing the stage one set moral development piece of punishment and obedience because they're afraid of stage two. Now, stage two is stage two out of six. So in order to develop, according to Kohlberg, into um, an ethical human being, and my memory of his theory is that most people don't hit that final stage but most people do get as far at least to stage four. So let me just review the stages quickly. Stage one we said is punishment and obedience. Stage two would be instrumental relativist, do what feels good. Stage three is what he referred to as good boy, nice girl, but it's essentially do it because you care about the person who's asking you. And then stage four, law and order, because it's your civic duty. Stage five is a social constructionist stage because it's what we've agreed to do as a society. And stage six is universal ethical because it's the right thing to do. He theorizes again that hopefully most people hit stage four by adulthood and some people definitely move further on to stage five and six. I think what the fundies really expect, so I think the, the highest stage they ever expect a person to hit is stage four um do it because your duty or do it because god says so right and god's law says so which i would think is a yes a um that would fit version in, yeah. of stage four <laughs> the thing that they seem to want is for people to exist in stage one do it because i will be punished if i do not do it until they are 
18 or otherwise adults and then magically jump to stage four. Do it because God's law says to do it. Which doesn't work according to this theory. And this is, you know, there are, there's never only one theory for something, but Kohlberg is really one of the um, more well-known theorists of moral development. Although a lot of theories of child development have moral aspects to them, he's the only one who really goes straight up into making it sort of a comprehensive thing unto itself. So I was just going to say, I feel like the entire book is creating an environment where you will never be able to pass stage one because it's literally your entire world until the second that you're let free. So I guess until the second that you're married. Yeah. But even then, it's just obedience towards someone else. I don't know how a person is supposed to develop to that stage four if they've been kept at stage one their whole lives. Oh, my God. I just had a brainwave. Go ahead. So, you know how when we were reviewing the, the fundy sex content, the girl defined a, a it's fundy... It's burned into my brain, unfortunately. Yes. Um, so much of that. So much of that was just like Bethany Beal just having to say over and over and over and over again it, it feels good you should be trying to do it like over and over and over and over again trying to drill into people's brains that this is a thing that feels good so you should be trying to do it and trying to experience it and god intends for you to experience it but i'm realizing that that's like now, now that you've brought up the the stage two the do it because it feels good they've never had that and they've been like intentionally kept from reaching that stage and she's trying to like beat that message into people whose entire existence has been based around that message is a bad message and that message is wrong and she's just like man i think you're i think that's a, a really good take and you're absolutely correct and kind of crazy that beth amini beal is trying to help people develop morally <laughs> Well, because also like, she uh, accidentally what so what's interesting about stage two and stage three is I heard sermons against stage three doing it because you care about the person who's asking you to do it. Um, I would hear sermons like, well, if you're only doing right to please your parents, then that's just as much an affront against God. I wonder what the fundy stages of moral development would look like. Well, that's I mean, I feel like I'm watching the good place right now. <laughs> Like, cheaty. <laughs> there is no moral development for the fundies. You don't develop your own morals because that's also a sin. Oh. It's because then you're not relying on God. Because you're an independent thinker. And mm -hmm. that would be bad. Well, that's crazy. Yeah. That's like what we talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Sadie's faith journey and about how so many people believe that you can't be a good and moral person without God telling you what to do. And how it it took me going through it to fully understand that a person can have a, not just a vague, but a defined and well-rounded moral code outside of their beliefs about God. Well, I guess part of deconstruction is just having to go through all of these stages of moral development when you've basically just had those stages blocked and impeded for years. Yeah. And that's so painful. Why do you think so many people deconstruct? They start doing what feels good. Right. They get out of control. Yeah. A lot of people do okay. A lot of people don't do okay. And they get out of control with something or another that they've been told they can't do. And they go overboard on that thing, whatever it is. And then end up in an abusive relationship because they're doing what they're told because they want to please the person who's asking them to do it, which might be a partner who does not have their best intentions at heart. Right, because they just, that's that separate from the moral development. They just don't know how to- Man. Identify what's healthy mm -hmm. for them. It also really reminds me, because he talks about the Amish so much in this book, about like the Amish rumspringa, mm -hmm. and I obviously don't know a ton about it, but it does seem, I do know that a large portion of Amish teens who go through that do come back to the faith. And there's part of me that's sitting here going, okay, so like, do they do what feels good? Then a parent's like, hey, you coming back? And they come back because the parent is the person that they care about. And that's, that's sort of how they move forward through their moral development. Like they give them an opportunity huh. to move forward. <clears throat> Man. That would be a good explanation of why so many Amish do end up going back to the faith as adults. 
this is yeah. fascinating. This is this is incredible. So I, I do want to talk about um, stage two and, and doing what feels good, because I think there's an additional outcome of children never being able to experience that. Okay. That needs to be talked about. I think when children never learn to do what feels good, a lot of times it turns out adults who don't know what they want in the world. Like, I, I can tell you, my least favorite question is what do you want? Like, what do you want for dinner? Or what movie do you want to watch? Or what movie do you want to go see? Or where do you want to go tonight? I hate being asked what I want because it is so hard for me to figure out what I want. Because I was trained not to want things. So if Jonathan's like, hey, do you want to get takeout tonight? And you're like, sure. And he's like, where do you want to go? Yeah, I don't like that. That's difficult for me because it is so difficult to identify what wanting is or what how I experience wanting outside Man. of needing. Like I need to drink some water. <laughs> I need to go to sleep. But like outside of needing, it is very hard to understand what wanting means because I was so trained to not want something. So I wanted to talk a little bit about how I've been working on that and trying to retrain my brain because I do maybe think it's working, which is kind of exciting. Yeah. What I've been doing is setting myself up on purpose to have a choice between two things that I might particular that I might want or not want. Um, and I make it as low stakes and as low pressure as possible. Um, and a, a choice that doesn't affect anybody else. Because if I make it a choice between three things, I get completely overwhelmed and I cannot handle it. And I will end up having none of the three things. <laughs> That's interesting. We actually, when I'm doing parent training with kids, um, and this is a common thing to do with toddlers. I don't know if you're doing this with Chuck yet. When they start having strong feelings about what they wa want to wear, you give them two choices. Yep. Or you say, you know, they're, they're tantruming because they don't want to go the house out of the house. You say, do you want to put on your shoes first or do you want to put on your jacket first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Chuck doesn't care what she wears for the most part yet. She is extremely picky about her shoes. Uh-huh. So I can see that. That's a comfort thing, man. Yeah, you know? I can relate, though. And my actually, my nephew also. <laughs> With her, it's, do you want to wear your blue shoes or your orange shoes? Do you want to wear your heart jacket or your rainbow jacket? Do you want to walk out of the house or do you want to ride in the stroller today? And those are kind of the, the choices that she gets when we're on our way out of the house. Um, and you find that you still need to like whittle things down to those two choices to feel yeah, I Because fundamentalism taught me to overthink and over-spiritualize every decision. Uh -huh. Like just agonizing over what is the will of God for my life and is it God's will if I go to this activity or not, all of that sort of thing. But also because I was trained to have as few wants as possible and to, you know, surrender my wants to Jesus and he will give you what you need and that sort of thing. So I'll set myself up, you know, oh, I'm going to have a can of cider tonight. Do I want the cranberry flavor or the marionberry flavor? Or I'm going to have a dessert tonight. Would I like to have ice cream or would I like to have cookies? And those are incredibly low stakes choices that don't, they don't affect anybody else. It's a binary this or that choice. And that allows me to examine the feelings of which one do I want? not over, oh, if I have this ice cream, then it, that's the last of the ice cream, and then my husband might not be able to get any. Right, because if it's a takeout thing, then you're not just picking what you're going to eat, you're going to pick what somebody else is going to eat, too, and that's like... Right, and I'm not capable of picking what I want in that situation yet, because I'll pick something that I want less that I think he would enjoy more. That sucks! Because I was so trained to put other people, especially my husband's opinions and desires so far above my own wild thing that i'm thinking about right here you know how there's like the stereotype about women never knowing what they want to to mm. eat <laughs> maybe maybe that's because women are socialized to put other people's needs ahead of their own and so they don't actually want to say when it's like where are we going to go get food i don't man this is wild could uh, be 
So, Sadie, have you ever tried asking your husband to give you two choices of things he'd be happy with? No, but I think I will. Wow. Might take the pressure off you. So, um, I think that I think that this moral development thing has very practical implications in a person's life. And that that's the sort of thing that really sticks around. And it's kind of cool for me because this is the kind of thing I learn in school as theory, but don't often, at least in when you're working with kids, you don't usually end up discussing like where your moral development is. So mm -hmm. that's like kind of geeking out over here about that. <laughs> I think that um, I hope that I can encourage people to learn to to learn to experience the do what feels good stage in a healthy way. Because I think especially those of us who were assigned female as birth, at birth and raised as girls in fundamentalism really struggle with this more. I think people who were socialized male in fundamentalism tend to get to that do what feel good, feels good stage and just go buck wild. And people who were socialized female in fundamentalism tend to not know how to get into that stage at all. I think there's also a greater society issue with this, mm -hmm. as Gavi has said that there is a what's interesting it's almost the other way where like there's an expectation of women like moving on to that do it because you care about the person who's asking or because it's your duty and men are sort of allowed to stick around in that do what feels good stage and there isn't an expectation of them moving forward through those stages as quickly interesting when i was doing my manosphere deep dive that's where a lot of those people who are like the manosphere influencers there's basically one of their big messages is if you move on to this next stage or, or where you're like i'm doing this because i i care about the people who are around me or i'm doing this because i think it's it's a, a part of my duty or i'm doing this because it's the right thing to do they're basically part of a huge part of their message is absolutely not if you move on to that stage you're weak and you're not indulging in all of the things that are your right to indulge in yeah as opposed to christian masculinity influencers who seem in my opinion to kind of rush people through and encourage people to skip over page over step two rush through step three and get to step four very quickly having completely skipped the do what feels good or step three will almost be like a subsidiary step to step four, where su step three is like, okay, well, you're doing this because you care about the people around you. And step four is the law and order stage. But why do you care about the people around you? Because that's part of God's law. That's one of God's commandments that you have to honor your father and your mother, that you have to, you know, uh, 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 be good to your wife and be good to your family. And God is commanding you to do that. So step three is really a sub step of step four. So you don't have to worry about that as much. Makes sense to me. Should we? Um, so I want to move on and we're going to have to do another like horrible child abuse passage here, unfortunately. Ugh. I want to look at it's uh, page 47 in our document that we have. It's chapter six. The title of this chapter, unfortunately, is Applying the Rod. Ugh. Oh, man. Yeah, this is the rough chapter. This is the This is yeah, this is this is pretty rough. Um this passage is talking about how to perform the ritual of spanking your child. And they do, I say ritual very intentionally. They do make this a highly ritualistic thing. So the, the what they want you to do is be as be very calm, don't raise your voice and get your child to come to punishment willingly. And I'm gonna read the something from the early part of this chapter. At this point in utter panic, he will rush to demonstrate obedience. Never reward delayed obedience by reversing the sentence. And unless all else fails, don't drag him to the place of cleansing. Part of his training is to come submissively. However, if you are just beginning to institute training on an already rebellious child who runs from discipline and is too incoherent to listen, then use whatever force is necessary to bring him to bay. If you have to sit on him to spank him, then do not hesitate. And hold him there until he is surrendered. Prove that you are bigger, tougher, more patiently enduring, and are unmoved by his wailing. Defeat him totally, accept no conditions for surrender, no compromise, you are to rule over him as a benevolent sovereign. This paragraph is just, 
it feels like it's inciting violence. It feels like it should be illegal. This this made my skin crawl. Your first instinct is I must like if you are holding your child, no harm will come to this child that is in my arms right now. If you hold mm-hmm. any child, you know, it, 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 the, it, there's something in your brain that just goes, no harm will come to this thing that this this little tiny human that I am holding. Part of this feels like it's as much training parents as it is training children, but it's training mm-hmm. parents to say. You have to steal yourself to ignore the part of your brain, the little voice in your head that's telling you this is wrong and I shouldn't be doing this. There's another passage in this book that I want to tie in with this. Um, It talks about, hypothetically, if a father is spanking the child and the mother happens to be in the same room and the child is reaching out to the mother to try to get the mother to show mercy on the child and get the father to calm down that the mother should stay in the same room but ignore the child or join in on the abuse if i remember correctly right and this which is, is such like a fun sorry to interrupt no, go it's ahead. such a fundamental betrayal of trust when you're calling out for help and the person you think is going to help you this is You know, you had asked at the beginning of the episode, do I think like the pearls are worse or Josh Duggar is worse? You know, in when you get to a paragraph like this and the previous one, it makes me start to think like, like they're all bad. There's no right answer to that. Yes, the research says that sexual abuse has longer ramifications, bigger picture, but like emotional abuse is really bad. And I would like, this is going to sound weird, but like, emotional abuse in many ways when you're getting this far into it is harder to recover from than just physical abuse because you can have a parent who doesn't understand that like physical punishment is abusive they read this book but they also really love their kids and they're not going to take it as far as this chapter recommends and so you know that's a lot easier to recover from than the emotional betrayal of the person you feel like or you think is supposed to be there to keep you safe is the person who is purposefully joining in on harming you. Is this the chapter where they say that you have to beat your child until they either cry or go limp? That is not written in this book, but that is fundamentalist teaching. So the passage I read a minute ago talks about uh, preparing your child to be beaten. And There's a lot of talk in fundamentalism about what to do specifically with usually older boys, but sometimes you'll see this in a particularly strong-willed girl as well um, in, you know, fundy conceptualizations of gender, that uh, these children will refuse to cry or physically fight the parent to attempt to get away from the beating and what to do with children like that. The recommendation is if they're not crying, beat them until they cry, or if they're moving, wiggling, trying to get away, beat them until they stop trying to get away. Because this is not about the pain, that none of this is ever about the pain that you're inflicting on your child. It's about control. And it's about breaking the child's spirit and making them submissive to you. And what I think goes on inside a kid's brain is along the lines of there's no way out of this for me except to give up there's no uh there's no recourse there's no way out until i turn 18 so the best thing i can do right now is just is literally and metaphorically just kind of play dead right or i guess and if you can talk your parents into letting you get married before 18. oh yikes (laughs) Man, if you, I mean, if you are raised with this kind of book and this kind of teaching, I do not blame you one bit if you go and see when you turn 18. That's just like, oh my God. I like, I, I don't know how like somebody could recover from this level of, of betrayal. So I did, I do want to talk about a couple other things here. Um, Shoshana, you were talking about emotional abuse being sometimes more difficult to recover from than physical abuse. And yeah. I, would, I would completely agree. My parents were certainly recommended to do things uh, similar to what was in this book, and they chose not to. But they did spank us. They did hit us. And I don't think that is a correct thing to do. You know how much your parents love slash loved you. Yes. And 
and in different types of emotional abuse and spiritual abuse that I suffered in the IFB have been infinitely harder to recover from. Yeah. Just, it's just, it's a different world of difficulty to recover from. So I think in, in my one person case study, that really backs up what you were saying about there are, there are things that are way more difficult to get past than physical abuse. Of course, depending on the severity, I know a lot of people had things a lot more severe than I did. Yeah. I mean, I have worked with plenty of children whose parents had real fundamental difficulties with the con showing their love consistently or experiencing love consistency, usually because of their own upbringing. That is so much harder even to watch as a therapist or address as a therapist mm -hmm. because there's nothing you can do except for help give your patient perspective that it's not their fault and hope that someday they can get to a place of understanding that like it's not i mean their parents aren't necessarily doing this purposefully because of their own trauma but to live in that third generation and have to be raised by someone who has experienced all like really terrible abuse and then as a result really can't function on their like in society as a result it's hard on children mm -hmm. What was the purpose? What was the intent of that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so kind of related to that, there is this phrase um, here in what section is this in, in chapter nine that says uh, most little bullies are cured by meeting a bigger bully. And my take on this is that because because in reading this book, part of the thing that I'm realizing is that the entire philosophy behind this parenting strategy is let them like let them know that you have supreme power and dominance over them and there is nothing that they can do about it and so it's almost like the they they put this in there but they don't have the self-awareness to know yes i am actually the bully here i am the bad guy here i am the i you know i mean if michael i don't know the, 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 seeing a phrase like this in a book like this really pisses me off it also isn't the only cure for bullying and we've seen a lot more research come out in recent years. For those of you who know, Massachusetts actually has anti-bullying laws on the books after um, a teenage girl, trigger warning, just she um, took her own life after being bullied. And so there was a law passed that made, makes it illegal. And one of the things that has come out of that is a lot more research around how to define what a bully is and how to assess what helps stop it. And one thing that we have learned is, especially in a group environment like that, one of the best things you can do to stop a bully is actually as a third party to say, no, this isn't okay. I, as a bystander, I'm not okay with you doing this. So if you, let's say, were in a social environment where other people did not use this book and they found out you did use this book, there would be an awful lot of pressure to not use this method of parenting, right? Right. And so that is actually just as successful often as meeting a bigger bully. So cultural change can have an impact on bullying situation. It's just dawning on me now that if you say most little bullies are cured by meeting a bigger bully, you are in effect saying that there will always be bullies. Because at, at some point, there's the, the big bully is the top of the bully chain. Well, the big bully is God. <laughs> and that kind of gets into the fundamentalist view of... You're right. That is what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but that's that's what the fundamentalist view of of what God is, is, is that God uh, actually kind of hates you. Yeah. It's that God will set you up to fail and then punish you for failing because that's their interpretation of the story of the Garden of Eden to begin with. Um, that's that's how they interpret it is. And it, that's mentioned in this book that that God set them up to fail and then punished them for failing. The pearls have set up this false binary in this book, and it is one of the central themes of the entire book that you have two choices as a parent. You either beat your child into submission and not only physically, but deeply emotionally abuse them, or you let your child walk all over you, 
you never have a moment, moment's peace and you are not able to put up any boundaries as a parent. You are a parent with no boundaries and you will be in misery until your kid learns to self-regulate, if they ever do. I'm sitting here realizing how exactly how frustrating that is to me as a professional, because there is a huge missing component of when, where, and how do people learn skills? The way effective parenting should work is to be teaching your child skills for the future. And there is nothing involved in skill building that goes into this binary. You're either not teaching skills and you're not doing anything, or you're not teaching skills because you're just like tamping everything down out of fear. Mm -hmm. So there's a section much later in this book that kind of deals with that, where they're talking about like, see, this is the excellent results that our methods have created. And, and Michael Pearl tells this story about how he's driving in an old army truck He's driving, I guess, down a dirt road with his his daughters, his family in this old army truck. He hears a noise in the old army truck that means that the batteries in the army truck, he knows that this noise means that the batteries are about to explode. And so then he tells his kids, you have to get out of the truck right away or something. And they get out of the truck right away. And he's like, see, if I hadn't, trained them to obey the commands of my voice then everybody would have died the, it, it, it's like a very self-congratulatory story where in in my mind i'm thinking this man is an idiot this man is like what is he doing a like you guys read this passage right oh yeah, oh, yeah. why are you putting your kid in such a dangerous situation to begin with that's for echoed, vibes that's echoed in the passage um trigger warning for firearms nobody gets hurt but this is dumb. It's, it, that's echoed in the passage where he talks about teaching his kids, quote unquote, gun safety by teaching, by letting his child play around an unloaded weapon and teaching them with the no command not to touch it and um, switching them as necessary as he thinks is necessary to prevent them from touching it so that his children will be able to play around weapons without touching them. And... <laughs> It, it wouldn't it be better to not put your kid in danger to begin with. Yeah, Michael Pearl's out here is like, I could leave the safety off on my gun and leave it out on where the, my kid could on find the it on the table. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of like that, that, uh, you know, that Trailer Park Boys episode where Cyrus is like nine millimeter safety always off. Got it from my dad in grade seven. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Kate, let's not use Trailer Park Boys as an example for how to teach our children anything. I can think of another example that made, like, when I read this section, that I thought of immediately. There was all this stuff around a YouTube video that Joanna Duggar posted. Yes. Where there were guns in the background. And I immediately wondered, oh my God, is she using this method? I, I think it's completely possible. So what he, what he teaches his kid to do is to have a reaction to associate the word no with being hit. And right, he also, which is considered a secondary reinforcer for those of you who know behavior theory. He also talks about teaching his kids not to touch a hot stove with the word no. And this is yet another example of a false binary. Like basically, if you don't teach your children to react to associate your no with being hit, they will touch any dangerous thing that is around. And this is why I, I don't mean to set myself up as a parenting expert, but what I do know perfectly well is that you can train your child for safety without hitting them. Because, yes. So you can teach your child to not touch a hot stove without hitting them. So I that's what frustrates me about this this false binary that they've set up. Like you either hit your children or you will never be able to have authority in your house. You will never be able to set a boundary. You will never have a moment's peace. Your children will mess with every dangerous thing that there is. And yes, toddlers go to the dangerous things. It's what, it's what toddlers do. They have a superhuman sense for things that could potentially cause them harm. 
I knew I, someone once who said the first year of life is keep is trying not to kill your kid, and the second year of life is trying to keep your kid <laughs> from killing themselves. Oh, that is so accurate. I'm not an expert. I'm not exceptionally, you know, I'm not a, a, psycho a psychologist <laughs> with a doctor's degree. <laughs> Um, but I, but you're have, a parent who's paying attention. I am just a parent who's been paying attention and I have a boisterous, bubbly, energetic toddler. Um, I have a fairly high energy toddler, um, from having known a lot of toddlers and babysat toddlers and taught toddler junior church. Chuck is far from the first toddler that I've been responsible for. And, uh, she's not a 10 on the energetic toddler scale but i'd put her at at least a seven or an eight she's she's pretty up there <laughs> and mm -hmm. i have effectively been able to train her to not touch hot things and to not pull hair she really doesn't pull hair anymore and she is but you're not really training hurting. you're teaching you're yes. teaching and she is just barely two and now every once in a while if she's really overtired she might pull hair but it used to be daily and I have been able to teach her that without hitting. So I think that's why this bugs me so much that that false binary of you have two options as a parent. Right. They're out of control or you have to like mm -hmm. come down hard. I agree. The thing that really annoys me about this is that the example that Michael Pearl had to like pull out of his ass to be like, see, this is why this teaching is important is an example where he was basically just being an idiot because I guess he feels like I'm going to drive around in an old army truck because I'm a old man and they made him better back in the day, even though his old timey army truck explodes when you drive it. <laughs> like get up like get a better car michael pearl if you got a better car and weren't just like driving an old ass army truck for vibes and being like no this is how we did it back in my day in the old way they don't make a lot of these anymore like if you weren't <laughs> that dipped that is just like ugh. well he's he's trying to train children for like ultimate ultimate parental convenience right Yes. Right. Like I'm going to train my kids so well that I can make stupid choices and they'll, they will survive. Right. And the thing about raising children differently and raising children without hitting them is that it is harder than just hitting the kid and forcing them to do what you say. Although um, I think there are people out there who like fundamentally, not only do they not believe in hitting, it's not just not in their nature. And they're not people who strike out out of frustration, out of anger. Like, they really wouldn't ever hit because it's just so not them. And it leaves them completely like, I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. I have met many parents who don't know what to do and who are so afraid of setting limits with their kid that their kid is out of control because the only other way that they had known from their own childhood was that physical aggression. Mm -hmm. Well, there's also the part in this book where they recommend that you hit your child if they won't go down for a nap. Like th this is, it's just like the most, they're like, what do you do? Uh, you hit them. You know, it's just their solution to literally everything. I mean, if you hit a kid hard enough with a frying pan, they'll go to sleep, but I don't really <laughs> know if that was what they were getting at. Yeah. It's like fall asleep or I'll beat the f out of you, you know, surprise. I'm now you have sleep paralysis demons like th <laughs> that that was awful that was so awful to me ah. because like it's not healthy to always see children as little adults or to see children as tiny adults at all but it's also not healthy to see kids as some kind of non-human creature kids are people and don't you have times when it's hard for you to get to sleep for whatever reason like as a human. That's why it irks me when parents are so insistent on their kid trying everything on their plate every single time, even if their child has demonstrated that they really don't like it. Like I get that there are plenty of kids and I see plenty of kids who have a very limited diet and are not open to trying new things. But like, you know, if you've given your kid tomatoes 12 times and every time they hated it, like, can you just accept that your kid doesn't like tomatoes and not give it to them? Yeah. Aren't there foods that you don't like as an adult? 
And how would you feel if somebody brought a food that you don't like and tried to push it into your mouth with their hands? Right. You would probably not be very happy about that. And that's, I think, what you were talking about way earlier, Shoshana, about respecting your children. Yeah. Like, there is, there is a way to parent your children that respects them as a human being and still allows you to set boundaries. Right. And does not require you to hit them. And you are not getting oh, completely overrun by your children's every whim all day, right. every day. Yes, you are and should be the one in charge in your home. Yes. Because you are the adult and you have a more developed brain and you are responsible for them. But it doesn't mean that they should just do it because you're the parent and they're the kid. Like, uh, I know a lot of people and I've worked with plenty of parents who have a feeling that like they're the parent, therefore they should get away with doing things that the kid doesn't do mm -hmm. and is not allowed to do, even if it's the same action. And kids notice that and they like see it and it's just not an excuse to say well i'm the parent i j i should be able to do whatever i want in whatever context and can't like the most effective way to parent is to be consistent which also means being consistent with yourself so i think my final thoughts on this book are just that the the methods that are encouraged by michael pearl in this book I think they are ineffective and tend to turn out adults who don't have a sense of self. I think that's the whole thing. It's these, these methods take away a kid's not right, not even their right to self-determine, but their ability to self-determine. I think this, this, um, damages kids at least as much, if, if not more, than the physical abuse that is recommended in this book and the big message that i wanted to get through in this episode because i know from our demographics that a lot of listeners are parents is that they're the the idea that it is one or the other beat your kids or get overrun forever is simply not true and that there are actually multiple parenting styles in between and multiple uh valid <laughs> methods that work that are neither one of those things uh shoshana do you have final thoughts on this book i have similar final thoughts my final thoughts are very much along those same lines of it isn't a dichotomy of beat your kid or you're gonna get run over i would encourage parents to read up on different parenting styles there are a lot of things out there some of them are kind of kooky but a lot of them are really good and the vast majority of them these days really kind of espouse similar methods. Some of them are different in how they present, different language that they use, but most things I've seen talk about one, as I've said before, consistency being really important and two, kind of giving tips and tools about how to be consistent. The piece that I would say is most important to hold on to is parenting choices should be made thinking about what are you teaching your child and what do you want to teach your child so going into it knowing that you're not doing it because you're responding out of emotion you're not doing it be just because someone told you to do it but you can say to yourself okay, this is what I'm teaching them. That being said, realistically, 60, 80% of the time, no parent can function that way. They just do what they like do. And it's okay if you feel like what you do isn't working and you need help doing it differently. It's okay to reach out for help, especially if you don't have models from your own childhood of how to do it in a way that you want to get it done. Yeah, I I love that um, you said it's it's okay to reach out for help. I think with social media parenting and people who a lot of people portray a kind of perfect life on social media, and that may be what we see of other people's parenting. Well, that's what Michael and Debbie Pearl are trying to sell here. Is yes. they're just like, our family is absolutely perfect. Our kids obey our every command and they are perfectly well-balanced. And this is how we did it. 
Yes. So this was happening in books before it was happening on social media. And there can be such a, an emphasis on being the perfect parent and having it all together and never needing any help from anybody else. Well, Sadie, we've spoken about this on the show that like in maybe growing up in the nineties in, in just that it was such like a sort of like prosperous time, like the cold war was over mm -hmm. and then they're just like, we're the, this new generation, this, this new millennium is coming. Everything's going to be great. There was such an emphasis on like, let's raise super children. Like let's raise every kid is going to be above average. Mm -hmm. You know, every kid is go every, your kid could be a genius if you do everything right and they could follow their dreams and have this perfect life full of joy and creativity, but you have to do everything right. And you have to raise them to the X, Y, Z thing. And like, <laughs> I mean, but that's been around forever, but I do feel like there was an emphasis on it when we were young. I don't think there's such thing as a perfect parent. I think in many ways it's kind of a ridiculous concept because what a child needs is not the same all the time. And so part of it is whether you're a good parent-child match. If your natural parenting style is what your child needs. And part of it is you don't need to be doing everything perfectly to raise a healthy child. One of my favorite um, child development theorist talks about the concept of a good enough mother. I do truly, truly embrace that concept in many aspects of my life. Now, I used to be someone who strived for perfection, and now I realize that it's okay just to be good enough. I think that this ties so heavily into fundamentalism because the fundamentalist teaching is if you raise your child well enough, if you do everything right, if you are as close to perfect as you can be and you follow this book or you follow Jack Hiles parenting books or whomever it is that you follow, if you follow them well enough, your children will grow up to go to your preferred Bible college, have the perfect theological views, marry a perfect fundamentalist spouse, give you grandchildren, go be a missionary, be a pastor, be in full-time Christian service somehow. And if, you, if your children do not turn out that way, then you failed as a parent. And I've heard so many stories of fundy kids leaving the church, starting to go through deconstruction, and their parents being shunned by their church community because the church community assumes that their parents did not follow the rules well enough at home, and that is why their child is now not following the rules. Well, speaking about perfection, what was it that your dad would say is that it's a sin to do less than your best? My dad would say it's a sin to do less than your best, and actually that comes off kind of positively for me because my best doesn't mean perfect because some days my best is my toddler is fed and alive and we are human and part of humanity is not being perfect but yeah my best does not necessarily mean perfect um 99.5 percent of the time and some days my best is the bare minimum and that's okay. But if that's my best, I did my best. Thank you to Sadie's dad for that, um, because that's actually positive and nice. Yeah, um, <laughs> much better than than anything in this book. Beat your child if they're not having fun. Beat your child if they are having fun. Beat them if they uh, it's, aren't I mean, sleeping. It's, uh, beat them yes, if they are them. sleeping. Be beat them if you call them and they're asleep and they don't hear you. Beat them if they uh, don't like whatever food you make. Beat them if they uh, look at the wrong direction. Beat them like, uh, they're awful people. And um, I don't know. And I like they should be in jail for writing this book. The thing is, Gavi, if you do choose to have kids one day, you know you can do better than this. Yeah, absolutely. I would never do any of this. Um, and I want to encourage, like, I know that we have a lot of listeners who deconstruct, ex fundy, deconstructed, and then had children, um, similar to how the my life went. And I know we have a lot of parents who are listeners who are parents who had children while still fundy. And now we're in the process of deconstruction and might feel guilty, might have done some of the things in this book in the past and feel guilty about that. Um, if that's you, one resource I would check, recommend you check out is Ben Williams, who writes for Path to Freedom. He writes about a lot of that kind of guilt and how he has worked on healing his relationships with his older kids who were raised in fundamentalism. 
I'm sure we'll have more resources in the source notes, but what I would like to say to any of those parents who do have past experiences in fundamentalism is what helps me is to remember that I cannot be a perfect parent. I cannot, that, that is not humanly possible to be perfect, but I feel more confident when I remember that I know that I can give my kid something better than this. I can accept my own imperfection when I rest on my confidence that I, I know I can do better. But it's also okay not to do perfect or even really good. Like it's okay when you have those minimum days. Well, thank you so much, Shoshana, for being with us on this episode and for giving us all of your expert opinions. We're sorry for making you read such a terrible book, but we really appreciate you being here for our listeners. And I uh, hope we've been able to say things that were helpful and encouraging and not terrible. It's been my pleasure being here. I found the book very enlightening. I think it gave me a lot of insight into um, some of the families that come work with me because they're trying to undo this kind of parenting that they had. Um, so it's been, you know, a great experience for me as well. And I appreciate you asking me to do it. You're welcome back on the show. Anytime that uh, we have something related to uh, next time child we find development, mental health, things like that, that you've been fantastic. Next My time pleasure. we find something that's too terrible for the two of us to handle. <laughs> okay. So that's it for that episode. Um, so I wanted to once again thank Dr. Fagan for being with us for this episode. To our listeners who may have uh, been affected by this kind of child rearing methods, I hope that you take good care of yourself today. This is a topic I've been very slow to bring up because I know that it can cause potential harm to people, but I really hope and believe that our episode today will have been a positive addition and not a negative one. Yeah, if you are, and as always, if you like our show, if you're a fan of our show, um, make sure that you subscribe to our Patreon if you want to support us. Uh, that is patreon.com slash leaving Eden podcast. You can join our Facebook group, which is facebook.com slash groups slash Eden Exodus. You can join our subreddit, which is reddit.com slash r slash Eden Exodus. Make sure that you listen to the She Red podcast. Uh, there's an episode coming out tomorrow in which Sadie and I... Uh, talk about a book from Sadie's childhood called Emily of New Moon, and that was a really fun conversation. If you are an LGBTQ person and you want to send us a pride story, please send those to leavingedenpod at gmail.com. We'd love to read your stories on the air. Make sure that you include your name, your pronouns, um, and and whatever you would like us to, to call you so that we can refer to you with the respect that you deserve as a human being. You can follow the podcast social media on Facebook and Instagram at Leaving Eden Podcast, on Twitter at Leaving Eden Pod. Um, Sadie, do you want to plug your social media? Sure thing. You can follow me on Instagram at Sadie Carpenter Music, on Twitter at Hell Yeah Sadie, and on TikTok at Sadie Carpenter One. Yeah, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Next week, we've got a deep dive into Jerry Falwell and uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church and uh the moral majority and liberty university so that's going to be really exciting part one of a two-part episode thank you guys so much for tuning in and we'll, we'll see you then bye-bye